This is a summary of Murdered Furbia Faye Tinsley by Crime Junkie. The morning of July 14, 2012, started like any other for Teresa, a resident of Prospect Avenue. As she sat on her back porch, enjoying the stillness of the morning air, she was abruptly interrupted by two loud pops. The shots had to have been pretty nearby, right? And she thought, trying to discern the source of the noise. However, Teresa's nonchalant reaction was not surprising, as random gunfire was not uncommon on her street. But as the morning progressed, another peculiar sight caught Teresa's attention. A green Honda Pilot SUV parked in front of her house with the engine idling and the dome light on. Concerned, she called her husband and together they approached the mysterious vehicle. What they discovered inside was nothing short of shocking. A middle-aged woman, Faye Tinsley, slumped in the driver's seat, blood surrounding her head. The police were immediately notified, and it became apparent that Faye's death was not accidental. Detective William Newberry was assigned to investigate the case. As he carefully examined the crime scene, he noted the absence of any signs of forced entry or struggle. Faye's body remained seated, her seatbelt still fastened, and her head turned towards the street. The presence of two spent shell casings indicated that she had been shot, possibly twice. However, her purse and wallet were missing, suggesting foul play. The question then arose, what was Faye doing on Prospect Avenue that early morning? She had grown up in Charlottesville and knew the city well, but her listed address was elsewhere. Detective Newberry began to search for connections and potential motives behind Faye's presence in the area. With every lead, he delved deeper into Faye's life, uncovering a complex web of relationships and secrets. As the investigation progressed, Faye's story unfolded, showcasing the importance of understanding one's past and the impact it can have on the present. Detective Newberry's relentless pursuit of the truth became a personal mission. He refused to let Faye's story remain untold, even when faced with retirement and the fading hope of closure. To early news coverage, like if you look up this case, Faye's mother, a woman named Barbara Page, was quoted as saying that the inside of the Honda was, quote, tore up. But this statement immediately caught the attention of Detective Newberry, who was investigating the case. However, he quickly realized that this information was misreported. The contents of Faye's car didn't show any signs of being ransacked. His car don't show any signs that it's been ransacked. In fact, Detective Newberry confirmed there were no signs of a struggle or anything out of place. It seemed more likely that Faye had been taken by surprise. The incident happened early in the morning, and not many people were awake at that time. Most of the people in the community weren't even up yet. Hon Detective Newberry explained, this made it difficult for investigators to find witnesses who might have seen or heard something. The neighborhood had a strained relationship with the police, and the lack of trust made it even harder to gather information. The relationship between black citizens and the Charlottesville police was not good at the time and historically had never been great. And Detective Newberry acknowledged, despite their efforts, the investigators couldn't find any leads from the neighborhood. Other 911 calls came in to even report the shooting in the time frame that Faye was killed. So, as Detective Newberry revealed, the lack of cameras in the area further hindered their progress. Frustrated, the investigators turned their attention to the physical evidence. They set up a white tent over Faye's car to preserve the crime scene, anticipating an approaching rainstorm. Meanwhile, a group of people from the neighborhood gathered behind the crime scene tape, taking pictures with their cell phones. One of those pictures made its way to a woman named Tutti. Rainy, slightly blurred image shows a green vehicle with a white tent set over it. it uh, the text message read, Tutti couldn't believe what she was seeing. It was her mother's car. Frantically, she tried to reach her mom but was unsuccessful. The situation began to sink in, and Tutti's panic grew. Tutti reached out to Sharonda, Faye's best friend, and her daughter's other grandmother. The calls became more desperate as Tutti pieced together the horrifying reality. Finally, she made the final call to Sharonda, sobbing uncontrollably. She explained that something terrible had happened to Faye. Sharonda wasted no time and rushed to the crime scene. There, she learned the devastating news that Faye had been shot and killed. Tutti, overcome with grief, had to be held up by strangers. When Tutti finally spoke with the detectives, she revealed that the last time she saw her mom was the previous evening. 
Faye had gone to play bingo at a local lodge and had won around $600. She planned to deposit the money at the bank before heading home. The theory of a robbery gone wrong began to fade as Tootie mentioned the money deposit. It seemed unlikely that Faye was carrying the cash with her. The investigators wondered if there was any evidence to support this. You sure that happened as planned, though? Like They questioned. They needed a receipt, bank statement, or surveillance footage to confirm the deposit. As the investigation reached a critical point, the detectives faced numerous challenges. The lack of witnesses and surveillance footage made it difficult to piece together the events leading up to Faye's death. Yet, they remained determined to find justice for Faye and bring closure to her grieving family. The search for answers continued, and every lead would be pursued relentlessly. Newberry wouldn't get into those details with Delia, but he will confirm that they have some kind of proof or some kind of confirmation from the bank that she did deposit at least some of her bingo money on Friday night after leaving the... This revelation had sparked curiosity and intrigue among the investigators. The whereabouts of Faye's money and the timeline of events were still shrouded in mystery. Assuming we don't know exactly when that was that night, right? Pondered Delia. The exact location of the deposit remained undisclosed, leaving everyone puzzled. Wouldn't even tell us which location that she did this at. But Delia lamented. The focus of the authorities, however, was not on the money, but on the confirmation that Faye had made it home safely after bingo. Sebastian Chavez, Faye's longtime partner and fiancé, had seen her that night. As the pieces of the puzzle started to come together, it became evident that Faye and Sebastian were deeply connected. They had been a couple for 20 years and shared a son named Tony, Sebastian, a parental figure to Faye's daughter, Judy, had been living with her at the Barracks West. Their apartment was a sanctuary, a place where they built a life together. When the detective learned about Sebastian's presence at the crime scene, he immediately sought to gather more information from him. Sebastian's distress was palpable as he recounted the events leading up to Faye's disappearance. Is distraught, but ju observed Detective Newberry. Sebastian revealed that Faye had returned home from bingo and had gone into their bedroom while he fell asleep on the couch. The next thing he knew, he woke up to frantic phone calls urging him to go to Prospect Avenue. Sebastian was as perplexed as the detectives about Faye's presence in that part of town. She didn't mention any plans about going to meet up with anyone who lived on Prospect Avenue. So he explained... The location of the crime scene only added to the enigma surrounding Faye's murder. The investigation took an unexpected turn when Sebastian disclosed a secret to the police. He's been cheating on Faye for a while. Stunned Detective Newberry, the revelation sent shockwaves through the room. It was rare for someone to be so forthcoming about infidelity during a murder investigation. The detectives were taken aback by Sebastian's honesty. Honestly, same. I... Delia commented. It was a refreshing change from the usual web of lies and deceit they encountered in such cases. As the investigation continued, the detectives delved deeper into Sebastian and Faye's relationship. They learned that their bond had been forged at the Veterans Administration Hospital years ago. Life had thrown them many challenges, from Faye's health issues to financial struggles. Sebastian had become Faye's caretaker, supporting her through her physical and mental health battles. The couple relied on Faye's veteran disability benefits and Sebastian's military benefits to make ends meet. Sebastian's confession opened a new line of inquiry for the investigators. They wanted to understand the dynamics of Faye and Sebastian's relationship on a day-to-day -day basis. Did they fight? Were there any major problems between them? Sebastian's honesty had set the stage for a deeper exploration of their connection and the possible motives behind Faye's murder. The case was far from being solved, but each revelation brought the investigators closer to the truth. The story of Faye and Sebastian was one of love, challenges, and secrets. As the investigation unfolded, the detectives would have to navigate the complexities of their relationship to uncover the answers they sought. With each step forward, the truth drew nearer, waiting to be unveiled in the shadows of their intertwined lives. Sebastian informed the detectives that he had been seeing a woman named Amy, 
who lived on Hardy Drive, several miles away from his apartment with Faye. Their relationship was mainly sexual, and he even paid her for her services. But here's the twist. Amy was cheating too, as she had a full-time boyfriend named Roy, who also lived on Hardy Drive, though not in the same apartment complex. Tootie, Faye's daughter, also resided on Hardy Drive, in the same set of apartments as Roy and Amy, albeit on the opposite end of the street. The affair between Sebastian and Amy had been going on for months, possibly even years, and they had managed to avoid getting caught. However, suspicions began to arise shortly before Faye's murder. Sebastian believed that Faye had become suspicious and tried to uncover the truth about his affair with Amy. While she hadn't seen them together, Tootie had heard rumors from others on the street and eventually shared them with Faye. Sharonda, a confidant of Tootie's, advised her not to tell her mom, fearing it would do more harm than good. But Tootie couldn't keep the secret any longer and broke the news to Faye. The timing of Tootie's revelation was a few weeks before the murder, adding another layer of mystery to the case. Hardy Drive, where Amy, Roy, and Tootie resided, was merely 1.2 miles away from Prospect Avenue, where Faye lived. The proximity between the two locations raised questions about the events leading up to the fateful night. Detectives focused on Faye's cell phone activity in the early morning hours of July 14th. They discovered that, apart from the phone call she made to Tootie, Faye had also called or been called by Roy. The timing of this call remained unclear, but it happened before the fatal gunshots were heard at 5.30 a.m. It appeared that Faye intended to confront Roy about the affair, seeking solace in someone who understood the pain of betrayal. She wanted to speak with him in person about the relationship that their significant others were carrying on behind their backs. So Roy Detectives managed to locate Roy and convinced him to cooperate. He revealed that Faye had visited him at his mother's apartment on Hardy Drive, where they discussed the complicated situation involving their partner's infidelity. As their conversation neared its end, a stranger suddenly appeared at the apartment. Faye, feeling sympathetic, offered him a ride to Prospect Avenue. Surprisingly, Roy decided to join them at the last minute. However, when they arrived at their destination, the stranger pulled out a gun and shot Faye. In a state of panic, Roy fled the scene, leaving Faye behind. It takes him less than 20 minutes to get back to his mom's apartment where he... Roy's actions after the incident raised suspicions among the detectives. They found it strange that he hadn't immediately contacted the police. Roy explained that he feared the shooter might come after him, knowing where he lived. Despite the unusual circumstances, the detectives couldn't dismiss Roy's story entirely, as his description of the shooter was incredibly detailed. Describes the shooter as a light-skinned black man with a thin beard and patch of hair on his chin. He says he's between 5'8", five 5'11", foot five foot has tattoos on both of his arms with cursive letters and tattoos on each of his hands that might have an M and a C. All the following day, the investigation escalated and the events continued to unfold rapidly. The detectives were determined to find the elusive shooter described by Roy. The urgency was palpable as they delved deeper into the case, hoping for a breakthrough that would shed light on the bizarre circumstances surrounding Faye's murder. In just a day, the detectives had unraveled a complex web of deceit and infidelity. The puzzle pieces were coming together, but many questions still remained unanswered. The investigation had taken an unexpected turn, leaving everyone involved hopeful that the truth would soon be revealed. Like, if you're getting this much right off the bat, I think they're feeling like they're going to solve this. Yeah, said Detective Newberry to his colleagues. The case they were working on involved a murder and a mystery that seemed to be unraveling slowly. The next day, the CPD issued a release with a suspect description provided by Roy, but they kept the source of the information confidential. Only a select few, including Detective Newberry, knew about Sebastian's affair, Amy, or Roy. The information was not released to the media at the time. The CPD didn't want to reveal too much yet, as their main goal was to seek help from the community in identifying the unknown person involved in the case. They wanted to determine if he was real, if he had any involvement, or if Roy was lying. Detective Newberry and his fellow officers took to the streets, 
combing the area between the crime scene and Roy's mother's apartment. They hoped to find evidence or surveillance footage that could either support or contradict Roy's version of events. And what they discovered was intriguing. The detectives questioned the clerk at a convenience store between Prospect Avenue and Hardy Drive. They struck gold when the clerk mentioned a peculiar encounter with a man who matched Roy's description. Surveillance footage confirmed that the man was indeed Roy, entering the store without any shoes. There were still many unanswered questions, but Detective Newberry remained tight-lipped about the details. The detectives couldn't find any other stores with footage of Roy along his route, making the convenience store encounter a crucial piece of evidence. The statements Roy made to the clerk were significant enough to the investigation that they were released for broadcast. While Roy was considered a strong person of interest, the same applied to his girlfriend, Amy. She provided little assistance during her interview, only acknowledging the personal nature of their relationship. Detective Newberry discovered that Amy may have been involved in sex work, an arrangement that Roy was aware of. He might have even benefited from her earnings and had knowledge of her clients, including Sebastian Chavez. The podcast Small Town Big Crime revealed that Amy either wasn't present or didn't see Faye at Roy's mother's apartment before the murder. However, she did visit Roy afterward and saw him shortly after he returned from Prospect Avenue. Amy didn't indicate to the police whether she believed Roy was involved in Faye's death. The suspect information about the man with cursive tattoos spread, but no calls came in with any leads. This led the CPD to suspect that Roy was either hiding something or withholding the full truth. Detectives found it peculiar that Roy had left town shortly after the murder. When questioned about it, he claimed it was a spontaneous decision to visit a family member in Buckingham County. However, the timing of their departure raised suspicions. Delving deeper into Roy's background, the investigators discovered a social media photo of him posing with a gun that matched the ammunition found in Faye's car. This information was kept confidential, known only to the authorities and not shared with the public or Faye's family. The investigation into Faye's murder continued, with detectives questioning every lead and scrutinizing every piece of evidence. The truth remained elusive, and the detectives were determined to uncover it. The case had captivated the community, and everyone was eagerly awaiting a breakthrough. As the investigation unfolded, the detectives were determined to find justice for Faye and bring closure to her loved ones. Only time would tell if their relentless pursuit of the truth would lead them to the answers they sought. Bullets that killed Faye stayed in her. Meaning, reveals the medical examiner in Richmond. The results of the autopsy examination indicate that Faye was shot twice in the head and neck, confirming her death as a homicide. The trajectory of the shots remains a mystery, as the police struggle to determine where the shooter was positioned in her vehicle. Roy's initial statement about his and the mystery man's seating arrangement during the shooting varies greatly, adding more confusion to the case. The investigation into Faye's murder raises numerous questions. Was there someone else in the car? Where did the shots come from inside the Honda? Detective Newberry admits that determining the exact location of the shots has been a significant challenge. Despite employing three-dimensional reconstruction technology, the findings have not been satisfactory for the authorities. Newberry believes that Faye was taken by surprise, likely by an assailant sitting next to or slightly behind her. It is unclear why Roy would kill Faye if he was being cheated on as well. The motive remains a perplexing puzzle for the investigators. One theory suggests that Faye might have confronted Roy about his mistreatment of Amy or other women involved in sex work. Whatever the reason, it seems that something was said or conveyed between Faye and Roy in her car that led to her tragic demise. The location of the crime scene adds another layer of mystery. Why were they on Prospect Avenue instead of the originally intended Hardy Drive? Faye's car was not moved after she was shot, leaving investigators puzzled about the circumstances surrounding the shooting. Roy's criminal history includes charges of assault, hit and run, larceny and grand theft, indicating a troubled past. Amy, his girlfriend, also has a lengthy criminal record, further complicating the case. In a bizarre twist, Amy was charged with malicious wounding on the same day as Faye's murder. Although the charges were later dropped, 
The coincidence raises suspicions. Law enforcement has extensively questioned both Roy and Amy over the years, but they have refused to provide any useful information. The search for the supposed mystery man described by Roy has yielded no leads, despite efforts to identify individuals with similar tattoos. The lack of physical evidence tying Roy to the crime hinders progress in the case. Although he admits to being in the car, the authorities require evidence directly linking him to the murder. The whereabouts of Faye's purse and wallet, potentially crucial pieces of evidence, remain unknown. Without concrete proof, the Commonwealth's attorney in Charlottesville is reluctant to move forward with the case. The focus on the unknown shooter remains the main obstacle to prosecuting Roy for Faye's murder. The fact that the gun and the mystery man have not been found raises doubts about the validity of Roy's claims. The case stalls, awaiting new evidence that could finally provide closure for Faye's grieving family and bring justice to her senseless death. Again, what if the guy isn't real? What if Roy made him up? Isn't that more proof that could be used against him? That's what I think, but I mean, I think what they keep coming back with is they're like, how do you prove someone isn't real? So, so what? All people have to do to get away with a crime is make up a fake person, and that's basically a defense wild card? You can avoid prosecution forever? That, that's not the message I want everyone going home with today, but it's wild, right? These are the questions that linger in the minds of investigators as they try to crack the case of Furbia Faye Tinsley's unsolved murder. The small town of Charlottesville is still haunted by the brutal crime that took place on that fateful day in July 2012. It's been years, and yet the killer remains at large, leaving the community on edge. The lack of a murder weapon adds another layer of complexity to the investigation, as well as the fact that they don't have the murder weapon. Okay. Now the authorities are left with limited evidence to build their case. But there's a twist. There was a small lead on the murder weapon for a hot minute. So Ballistics tests revealed that the casings recovered from Faye's crime scene matched those from unrelated shootings in Charlottesville. It appears that the same gun was used in multiple crimes after Faye's murder. It was a weapon. What circulating among criminals. This discovery raises new questions. What investigators need is to figure out whose hands it was in shortly after the murder, because that person might be able to tell them where they got it from, or more importantly, who they got it from. Right. Which, if they can trace the gun back to its original owner, they may finally unravel the truth behind Faye's death. But the investigation hits a roadblock when it comes to searching a particular property. So what about that family's place that Roy and his mom went to that morning? Did they ever search it? So that's the other thing. No, no. So they haven't been able to get a warrant approved to search it. Man, man. Which the authorities are hindered by legal constraints, preventing them from accessing potentially crucial evidence. It's frustrating, to say the least. As the years go by, the list of suspects narrows down. Today, law enforcement no longer suspects Sebastian Chavez of being involved in what happened to Faye. Initially, initially he was a person of interest, but after extensive conversations with Sebastian, it becomes clear that he had no substantial benefit from Faye's death. He eventually moves away, but he continues to check in with the police, hoping for progress in the case. Other individuals close to Faye, like her daughter Tootie, also remain vigilant and determined to seek justice. Tootie still lives in Charlottesville with her children, and she told Delia that she is fearful the person behind her mother's murder might still be living locally or have family in the city. But that doesn't mean she's not fighting for her mom. The Tootie's determination is evident in her active involvement in the Justice for Furbia Faye Tinsley Facebook page. She keeps the memory of her mother alive, sharing updates and urging anyone with information to come forward. The community rallies behind her, hoping that one day the truth will be revealed.